Hello everyone, I am Dr. Jay, your faculty for surgery. Now, in this session, we are going to talk about trauma. And in trauma per se, we are going to talk about the airway part. Now, before we start our discussion here, you all very well know, trauma is a very, very important topic for your examination point of view. Now, out of the various questions which comes from general surgery in your exam, you all very well know that the majority of the question comes from trauma and trauma is a clinical scenario and in any clinical scenario you can easily appreciate that a subtle change in the language of the question makes a gross difference. So we have to understand the concept here and in our discussion here on trauma in this session though we are going to talk about the airway part but what is important for you to notice in trauma try to understand the concept. So in this discussion in airway, we'll try to build some concept here because if you understand a concept here, whatever change in the language of the question in exam happens, you will have no problem in answering that question, whatever that, whatever way that the question is framed. So let us try to understand some basic concept in trauma here and Whenever a question on trauma comes, listen to this part also carefully. We have to answer according to the ATLS protocol. What is that ATLS protocol? ATLS is Advanced Trauma Life Support Protocol. In our part of the world, we manage a patient of trauma on the basis of this ATLS protocol. So what is that ATLS protocol? What is that algorithmic approach is there in that ATLS protocol is a very important thing for us to understand. So we are going to talk about this ATLS protocol in this discussion, the overview of that. But our main objective in this session will be to talk about and understand the concept in airway. So our learning objective here is we should be able to understand or make out after this whole session that what airway problem if the patient has, how will that patient will present? So after this session, we should be able to make out whether a given patient of a trauma has an airway problem or not. And then if there is an airway problem, what airway support we need to provide to this patient also, that also we should be able to make out after this whole session discussion. So before we get on with that airway part, let us understand the basic nuances of a ATLS guideline. So ATLS guideline says whenever a patient of trauma comes, you are supposed to conduct, you are supposed to conduct a primary survey first. There was also a question in your exam, what is a primary survey and what is a secondary survey? So what ATLS guideline says that whenever a patient of trauma comes, you should conduct a primary survey first. And once your primary survey is over, then you should conduct a secondary survey. So what is a primary survey and what is a secondary survey? We have to understand that. Primary survey, first of all, is a swift examination. Primary survey is, first of all, is a swift examination to find what is killing, to find what is killing and to take care of that. So what is primary survey? Primary survey is a swift examination to find what is killing and to take care of that. Secondary survey is an elaborate, secondary survey is an elaborate head to toe examination. So the ATLS guideline says whenever a patient of trauma comes, you have to conduct a primary survey first and you have to find out what is killing and to take care of that. And once you have taken care of what is killing, then only you should proceed to secondary survey. Now this then only part is another very important thing for us to understand. So what does that, that only uh, part me means? It means that your secondary survey can wait till eternity. Your secondary survey is not important. Your secondary survey can wait till eternity till the time you have not taken care of what is killing. So in any patient of trauma, so ATLS guideline says, conduct a swift examination immediately and find out 
whether is there anything which can kill the patient immediately or not so if there is anything which can kill the patient immediately you should first take care of that and then only proceed to a detailed head to toe examination so this is a basis of a atlas guideline first of all now first of all to find out what is killing you are supposed to conduct yourself in a certain manner which is a very very important understanding for you because on this basic understanding majority of the question in your exams are based because this is a base of a management of a patient of trauma so how we conduct ourselves in a patient of trauma in a systematic manner let us see and that systematic manner is a b c d and e in this order in your exam they have asked what a b c and d stands for in your exam they have also checked that whether you know the basic understanding of this a b c because just writing this a b c won't suffice because the kind of question you are going to get will be clinical conceptual so what a stands for what b stands for we have to know a stands for airway with restriction of cervical spine movement b stands for breathing c stands for circulation d stands for disability and e stands for environmental exposure so not only we need to know what a b c d stands for we have to understand the concept in this a b c d now what is that concept in a b c d let's know the atls guideline says you have to do this examination swiftly in this a b c d manner you have to conduct it swiftly but what is the bottom and line and the major thing in this the guideline says if a is not a problem if a is not a problem you should immediately go to b if b is not a problem you should immediately go to c but it also says at the same time if a is a problem even if there is a evident b and c problem in any given patient you cannot go to b and c till the time you have not taken care of the a completely so this understanding you have to engrave that if a is not a problem you have to immediately go to b if b is not a problem you should immediately go to c but if a is a problem even if there is a b and c problem you cannot go to b and c till the time you have not taken care of a completely so how will they frame this question and they have framed this question in the previous year exam already so how they framed it and we if we don't understand this we obviously uh, going to answer it wrongly what was the question it was said that the patient has a some stab injury in the neck and there's a profuse bleeding coming out from the neck wound and the you are told that the patient is cyanosed and the patient is having a profuse bleeding what is your next step so if you don't know that it is abc our first step obviously will be control of the bleeding but then that is not right we have to always follow abc because in any patient who has a neck injury there is a problem to the airway also are very high chances are there so in any patient of trauma just engrave in your mind that we have to follow a b c so if a is not a problem then only you can go to b if a is a problem you have to stay at a so in this discussion of trauma we will be majorly focusing on the a and after this discussion we understood that we have we, we should be able to make out whether the patient has a airway problem or not and if there is a airway problem how are we going to support that airway problem also so this a b c d part first we have to know now then another very important step wise thing which is asked in our exam which is a basic part of a atlas protocol also is that how you go about in any trauma situation this was also one of the question in your exam imagine you are called to attend a patient of trauma what will be your first step the atlas guideline says your first step should be scene safety now what do you mean by scene safety imagine we are here in this room and just across in another room there is somebody got trapped in a fire so you went inside and you started doing a b c d there so you had one patient earlier now two similarly you have a patient on the road 
and you started doing ABCD on the road and now there are, there are two patients. So always in any trauma scenario, first make the scene safe. Bring the patient to a safer place, take out the patient from the burnt area and make the patient safe and also yourself safe. So this scene safety is not only for the patient, is also for the rescuer. After scene safety, after scene safety, our next step is check response. After scene safety, our next step is check response. Very important algorithmic approach, very commonly checked. So if the patient is not responding, if the patient is not responding after you have checked the response, if the patient is not responding, you all know that we are not Bahubali or Pushpa, that we can manage everything all alone. So we would need help. So the next step is call for help. Now, till the time the help arrives, you have already called for help now, till the time the help arrives, now you have to follow ABC. Now you have to follow ABC till the time the help arrives. So we are now here going to focus on an airway part. So how will we know? We know that if A is not a problem, we have to go to B. If B is not a problem, we have to go to C immediately. But we also know at the same time, if A is a problem, we have to stay at A and we have to take care of A. So how will we come to know after calling for help whether the patient has an airway problem or not? So the next step after calling for help, the guideline says, is talk to the patient. The next step, the guideline says, is talk to the patient. Listen to this carefully. Very, very important understanding and this is what majorly checked also in our exam. The guideline says any patient who can phonate, any patient who can speak, we can take it for granted that airway in that patient is not a problem. So, you try to talk to the patient. So, if the patient is talking, if the patient is talking, you can make out in that given clinical scenario or in that given clinical question that the airway is not a problem in that patient, you can now go to B. But imagine the patient is not talking. Imagine the patient is not talking. Now, patient not talking to us, listen to this part also carefully, patient not talking to us can happen because of three reasons. Patient not talking to us can happen because of three reasons. One, patient has an airway problem. One, the patient has an airway problem. The second, patient has a head injury. The command is not coming. And third reason, which is not an uncommon reason, which is a very common reason which we come across in our emergency rooms, patient doesn't want to talk to you. Hurt. <laughs> patient doesn't want to talk to you. Very commonly it happens, hysterical patient or a functional patient. Patient may not respond, may, may, not, may not talk, you are trying to talk, patient is not talking because patient is hysterical or a functional patient. So how will we come to know in a given clinical scenario or in a given clinical question, the patient is not talking, is actually not talking because of an airway problem. So if in our given clinical question or if in a given clinical scenario in our exam, if the patient doesn't talk and the patient in the profile has tachypnea, means having a high respiratory rate or having a use of accessory muscles of respiration happening. Accessory muscles of respiration happening means patient having a, the, the, the uh, nasal LI getting aggressively uh, uh, elevated in this respiration and the patient, the muscles are majorly used which are not usually used in respiration are the accessory muscles of respiration. So if patient is using those muscles of respiration or patient is having a snoring happening or gurgling told to you happening or having a hoarseness or having a strider happening in the given question in exam or the patient has a cyanosis. So if any of these are provided, if any of these are provided in your any given clinical question in exam and the patient told to you is not talking, you can make out that your patient has an airway problem now you cannot go to B. So patient not talking with any of these things provided means patient has an airway problem we have understood. Now in this also we need to know this is the earliest sign of airway problem. Again a question asked. This is the late sign of airway problem. 
again a question asked so what is the earliest sign of airway problem we understood what is a late sign of airway problem that also we have understood so if patient is not talking any of these are there we know that there is a airway problem and we cannot go to b so in airway we have written airway with restriction of cervical spine movement now how will we take care of airway and how will we restrict a cervical spine because both these things should happen simultaneously both these things should happen simultaneously so what we have understood till now that which patient needs a airway support till now and what uh, uh, the algorithm of approach in a trauma is there now once we have understood that the patient has an airway problem how are we going to take care of the airway what airway support we are going to provide in a given scenario let us see for that we have to first know what airway support do we have with us so what are the airway supports we have with us and what are the supports we have for taking care of the cervical spine let me first tell you about a cervical spine and then i'll come to the airway so what are the supports we have to restrict the cervical spine and what are the supports we have to take care of airway we will be seeing here now for cervical spine we have mills what is mills mills is manual inline stabilization manual manually we will stabilize the cervical spine which is called manual inline stabilization and we also have a cervical collar with us we also have a cervical collar with us you can have a image based question in your exam where they, you are shown that the, the person is performing meals and asked what this maneuver the person is doing so you should know how it looks like we'll see that later but first we know what this meals is for meals is for a cervical spine stabilization so it is a manual inline stabilization and we have a cervical collar also and the cervical collar which you see patient walking the people walking on the road the so soft collar is not not used in trauma we use a semi rigid collar and that semi rigid collar is called a philadelphia collar this was also one of the question that what collar is used in trauma in stabilization of the cervical spine it is a semi rigid collar and it is called a philadelphia collar now what are the airway supports we have for taking care of airway we have chin lift we have chin lift we have jaw thrust we have needle cricothyroidotomy when to offer what we will understand here we will have a needle cricothyroidotomy thyroidotomy and we also have we also have a definitive airway for taking care of airway we have adjunct airways also to take care of the airway so what are the maneuvers we have chin lift we have jaw thrust we have needle cricothyroidotomy as a maneuver we have definitive airway we have adjunct airway in your exam there was a question already asked which of the following is not a definitive airway so we have to know what are the definitive airways once you know what are the definitive airway whatever left will be an adjunct airway so first of all what is the definition of a definitive airway definitive airway is tracheal intubation of any sort tracheal intubation of any sort which is secured which is secured and connected to oxygen source tracheal intubation of any sort which is secured and connected to oxygen source is the definition of a definitive airway so with this definition in mind can you think of any definitive airway which you know you can easily say that one of the definitive airway is orotracheal intubation and orotracheal intubation you can easily appreciate can be oral orotracheal intubation can be a nasal orotracheal intubation we have a oral uh, orotracheal intubation we can have a nasal endotracheal intubation so sorry this is endotracheal intubation this endotracheal intubation is a definitive airway and in endotracheal intubation we have oral endotracheal intubation we have a nasal endotracheal intubation we also have a surgical airway in surgical airway we have a surgical cricothyroidotomy we have a surgical cricothyroidotomy and we have a tracheostomy so what we have understood here in 
definitive airway we have endotracheal intubation we have surgical airway in endotracheal intubation we have oral endotracheal intubation we have a nasal endotracheal intubation in surgical airway we have surgical cathodotomy we have tracheostomy so these are the definitive airways we have whatever left now will be an adjunct airway an adjunct airway include oropharyngeal airway adjunct airway include oropharyngeal airway nasopharyngeal airway laryngeal mask airway laryngeal mask airway and we have multi lumen esophageal tube we have a multi lumen esophageal tube now how these tubes look like how we do all that we'll see later but let us first know that what are the definitive and what are the adjunct airways we have so we have understood till now that how to identify a airway problem and then what are the airway supports and what are the cervical spine support to restrict the movement we have so these are the things we have with us our patient has a airway problem we got to understand and now we have to proceed to managing that patient so we will first do a chin lift or jaw thrust we will first do a chin lift or jaw thrust in any patient with a airway problem the guideline says first do a chin lift or jaw thrust but this chin lift or jaw thrust can extend spine the trauma guideline says in every patient of trauma we have to presume in every patient of trauma the guideline says we have to presume that there is a cervical spine injury and we should not do anything which can extend spine so chin lift and jaw thrust can to a certain extent extend spine so the guideline says before proceeding to chin lift or jaw thrust provide mills so how will we do this chin lift or jaw thrust see this this is how we do a jaw thrust this is how we do a jaw thrust and this individual is providing mills so you can have a question in exam image in exam asking you which what individual is doing this individual is providing mills and this individual is doing a jaw thrust and this is how we do a chin lift so if you are asked how many individuals are required for chin lift if you are asked how many individuals are required in a jaw thrust checked also in our exam it is will be two so we do a mills and then we do a chin lift or jaw thrust and you have already called for help please go back to your scenario stepwise approach you have already called for help till the time help uh, help arrives till the time the help arrives we have to continue doing this till the time help arrives we have to continue doing this because our patient has a airway problem that is why we are we have stopped at a in a given patient so moment the help arrives now immediately apply a oxygen mask immediately apply a oxygen mask after this this stepwise approach is important for us after applying a oxygen mask after applying a oxygen mask the next step is you have to free the individual who is providing mills you have to free the individual who is providing mills by applying a cervical collar and we know the cervical collar which we use in trauma is this this is called a philadelphia collar so immediately now apply a philadelphia collar in a given patient now now after this after this now listen carefully after this you have to see whether your patient is in need of a definitive airway or not so you should know what are the indications of a definitive airway you should know what are the indications of definitive airway so in any given question in your exam if any of these indications are provided your patient would require a definitive airway which definitive airway will figure out after this so what are the indication of definitive airway if by any chance you are told patient has apnea in the given question in exam or by any chance you are told patient oxygen saturation is less than 85% please write down in capital letter on oxygen this on oxygen is important so in any given question in exam if apnea is provided or in any given question oxygen saturation is less than 85% on oxygen provided or the gcs of the patient provided 
to you is less than or equal to 8. So if any of these are there in your any given question in exam, not only your patient would need a airway support, but he would need a definitive airway support. So what definitive airway support you will provide? You will provide oro tracheal intubation. Now, very, very important. The latest and the protocol in trauma is whenever patient requires a definitive airway, we should always try a oro tracheal intubation first. Now, listen to this part carefully. If you have gone to the OTs, you all must have gone to the OTs. You have seen that how anesthetic is put in a tube. Very commonly, you have seen the anesthetist putting in a tube and how anesthetist put in, in a tube? They put an endotracheal tube by extending the spine. So, this extension of spine in trauma is just not possible. So, whenever we put a tube in trauma, whenever we put a definitive airway, again a question asked in your exam, we have to do a inline tube placement. What is this inline tube placement? Inline tube placement means you just don't have to extend spine. In the neutral position, you have to put in a orotracheal tube. In a neutral position, you have to put in a orotracheal tube. The ATLS guidelines says without extending spine. So, whenever we are putting a endotracheal tube in trauma, remember it should be put in line. How we put that in line, I'll show you. But first know that we have to put a tube without extending spine. And for putting this tube, it is a not an easy thing to put a tube in a neutral position. So the ATLS guideline says to help you out in this inline tube placement, you should use a video laryngoscope. Now we the guideline says there are video laryngoscopes available now. With the help of those video laryngoscope, the inline tube placement becomes easier. But then inline tube placement still is a difficult thing. So you should always put in a orotracheal tube with inline placement with the help of video laryngoscope. Now listen to this carefully. Earlier, earlier it was said that in a patient, this, this dictum also prevails today too, but then there is a slight change which has happened in the present protocol. Now the latest guideline says in any patient of trauma, you should always first try a orotracheal intubation, right? Earlier it was said that Whenever you are suspecting a base of skull injury, in our exams, mostly maxillofacial trauma is asked. And in a maxillofacial trauma with, with a severe maxillofacial injury, the Leafort kind of a fracture, the Leafort 3 kind of a fracture, there are very high chances of a base of skull injury. So whenever a base of skull injury is suspected, the guidelines earlier used to say that you should not put any nasotracheal tube. Nasotracheal, nasotracheal intubation should not be done. Now, what has changed in the recent ATLS guideline? Nasotracheal intubation should not be done because you can aggravate the base of skull injury in such patient. Now, the latest ATLS guideline says in any patient where you are suspecting a base of skull injury, not only nasotracheal intubation, no nasal intubation. No nasal intubation should be done. No nasal intubation should be done means you cannot put a nasopharyngeal airway. You cannot put a nasotracheal tube. You should not even put in a Riles tube through the nose. Whenever in a patient of trauma, you are suspecting a base of skull injury. So in a maxillofacial injury patient, very commonly there are chances of a base of skull injury. So no nasal intubation is the dictum in a trauma now. So, we always try in every patient of trauma a uh, orotracheal intubation because this inline orotracheal intubation is a difficult kind of a intubation. So, it may be successful, it may not be successful. So, if it fails to, if you fail to put in a, an orotracheal tube with the help of video laryngoscope inline in a patient of trauma, the guideline says then you should proceed to a surgical airway. The guideline says, then you should proceed to a surgical airway. And the surgical airway which we prefer in a trauma scenario is not tracheostomy. Please note, is not tracheostomy. It is surgical cricothyroidotomy because tracheostomy 
in this kind of a scenario takes a time and we are hard pressed on time in a time in a patient who has an airway problem we do a surgical cricothyrotomy there is a cricothyroid membrane exists between a cricoid cartilage and a thyroid cartilage we just give an incision over that membrane with the help of knife and with the same knife we stab that cricothyroid membrane and put a tube inside so that doesn't take a uh, even more than 30 seconds to put a tube tracheostomy take a longer time so in a trauma acute trauma settings when the orotracheal tube doesn't go we proceed to a surgical cricothyroidotomy remember and when are we going to do that whenever these indications are there with us whenever these indications are there we are going to proceed with this if these indications are not there with us we what we do we put a adjunct airway and we prefer putting a adjunct airway oropharyngeal airway we prefer putting a oropharyngeal airway in the adjunct airway so how to go about in a airway we have understood how to identify a airway problem we have understood and we also have understood that if there is a airway problem how to support that airway problem in a stepwise manner too now comes a very important thing sometime the patient has a injury like this a severe maxillofacial injury which most of the time in your exam is checked also so in such patient when there is a severe maxillofacial injury is there where you cannot make out where is chin where is jaw it is badly shattered face so in that case in such severe maxillofacial trauma patients where we cannot make out chin or we cannot make out jaw we do a needle cricothyroidotomy we do a needle cricothyroidotomy what is a needle cricothyroidotomy let us understand what we do in this needle cricothyroidotomy there is a cricothyroid membrane between a cricoid cartilage and a thyroid cartilage there is a membrane exists called cricothyroid membrane immediately in such patient who has a badly shattered face you should immediately put a needle a hollow chamber needle the guideline says which you have to remember in this needle 12 to 14 gauze needle we use in adult important and 16 to 18 gauze needle in pediatric so immediately put a needle which goes into the cricothyroid membrane and connect this needle immediately to a oxygen source oxygen source you have to connect to so what what is further very important for us this is a very important thing and this is also checked in our exam we have to make a hole we have to make a hole in this tube and why are we making this hole we are making this hole for 1 is to 4 ratio what is this 1 is to 4 ratio please understand for one second what we are going to do when after putting this needle and connecting this needle with the oxygen source we make a hole in this tube and for one second we are going to plug this hole for one second we are going to plug this hole with our finger and for four second four second we'll release our finger for four second we are releasing our finger so for one second when we are plug this hole the oxygen will go in and the four second when we have released our finger the carbon dioxide will come out so this will help in carbon dioxide to not get retained inside so this is called a needle cricothyroidotomy so what is important for us what size needle is used for needle cricothyroidotomy in pediatric and in adult and what is this 1 is to 4 ratio and what further is important for us is that this needle cricothyroidotomy can sustain the patient for 45 minutes needle cricothyroidotomy because carbon dioxide ret retention can happen because of this needle cricothyroidotomy sometime even when you are following a 1 is to 4 principle carbon dioxide retention can happen and we can sustain still the patient for maximum time we can sustain patient with needle cricothyroidotomy is for 45 minutes but when to do a needle cricothyroidotomy when there is a severe maxillofacial injury where chin lift and jaw thrust cannot be done and after needle cricothyroidotomy you can if there is an indication of definite airway after applying a collar you can proceed to in the similar manner so in this we have understood when to how to identify airway obstruction how to proceed to reach to airway problem first 
and then how to identify airway obstruction and if there is a obst airway obstruction what are the supports we have for airway and what are the supports we have for the cervical spine so if in our exam now this is also one of the question asked what is a priority in a patient of trauma listen to this care question carefully what is a priority in a patient of trauma airway or cervical spine we already know that it is airway with restriction of cervical spine movement but sometime in our exam what they do they ask what is our priority in a patient of trauma airway and cervical spine they give in a separate choice so if airway and cervical spine are given in separate choice your answer should always be airway remember and one more thing which is important for us whenever we put in a definitive airway whenever we put in a definitive airway when to put in a definitive airway we have understood whenever we put in a definitive airway the confirmation whether your definitive airway confirmation that whether your definitive airway is actually in airway how will that happen so what confirms that your definitive airway is actually in airway so if a question comes the confirmation of airway intubation confirmation of airway intubation happens with what investigation so if the question comes what is the confirmation of airway intubation just remember it is through a capnography so the answer is capnography just remember there is a capnographic graph which comes when we attach this uh, airway which is going into the, uh, uh, the the trachea to a monitor so we get a graph there a specific type of graph which is called a capnography so what is important for us confirmation whether the airway has gone into the airway or not the definitive airway has actually gone into the airway or not is confirmed by a capnography remember so this is something we have to know now how a chin lift and jaw thrust happen we have seen this is how we do a needle cricothyroidotomy we immediately put a needle in a cricothyroid membrane and this needle is connected to the oxygen source with 1 is to 4 ratio and this is how we put in a tube now they can ask you a question in exam we all know that the inline orotracheal tube is placed so they can ask you a question in exam that how many individuals are required in trauma to put in a inline orotracheal tube so they can ask a question in your exam that how many individuals are required in trauma to put an inline orotracheal tube your answer should be three now what are these three individuals are going to do see here one individual will be putting in a tube one individual will be putting in a tube like this in a neutral position the second individual will be providing mills because we don't want a spine to have a, any kind of a, a movement so second individual will provide mills and what will the third individual do third individual will provide burp third individual will provide burp what is burp he will give a backward upward and rightward pressure backward upward and rightward pressure over larynx so how many individuals are required for chin lift or jaw thrust how chin lift and jaw thrust look like we have understood how many individuals are required for a definitive orotracheal intubation three and what are these three individuals doing that also we have understood now how we perform a surgical cricothyroidotomy see this image this image is important so there is a cricothyroid membrane and we just give an incision over the cricothyroid membrane with the knife and with the same knife and the artery force we dilate that cricothyroid membrane and then we put a tube like this so this is how we do a surgical cricothyroidotomy and how a laryngeal mask airway looks like how a multi-lumen esophageal tube looks like and how a oropharyngeal airway looks like also is important for us so see this image this is how a laryngeal mask airway looks like this is how a multi-lumen esophageal tube looks like and this is how a laryngeal mask airway is placed which is an adjunct airway remember and this is how a oropharyngeal airway is placed and this is how a oropharyngeal airway looks like so these were the important images for our exam so in airway what all we have to know and understand let's summarize it we have to first know how 
what is primary survey and what is secondary survey and then how the algorithmic approach in trauma goes then further how to reach to the airway part in the systematic approach and then how to identify a airway problem then what are the definitive airways and what are the adjunct airways and what are the various maneuvers we have for airway support then we also need to know what are the indications of a definitive airway and how the algorithmic approach in airway goes and what are the indications of definitive airway we also have to know and then what is the algorithmic approach in that once the indication of definitive airway exists and then we also need to know how to confirm that our definitive airway is actually in airway and then in certain patient of a severe maxillofacial trauma where there is no chin or jaw is there the face is so badly shattered so what maneuver we do for taking care of the airways initially we have to know that is needle cricothyroidotomy and in that one is to four is the important thing so these are the things we have to know for our examination point of view on airway which is a very very important thing as far as your exam goes so this is all about our discussion on a airway